Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and this is my second attempt at reviewing Nubia Real One because I kind of choked under the pressure. The first video was an hour and 15 minutes. It would take me an entire day to, uh, so let's just start into it again. 499 graphic novel, rock and roll ninja graphic novel. These are both the entire story told in one book. Great stories, very exciting, you're gonna love them. So Nubia Real One, was announced a year or so ago, and people tried to get me to do videos, but I go, eh, it just looks like a cringy YA graphic novel. So for people who don't know what the YA genre is, it is female character, usually minority, their group of friends, usually gay, and white bullies. That's, it used to be about adventures, and now it's just that, over and over and over again. Somebody showed me a tweet where the uh, writer of this was saying she wrote this years ago and it's no you wrote a generic ya graphic novel about a black girl a few years ago and then dc came hey excuse me black women are fashionable now uh by coincidence we care so much just at the exact same time hey you there a uh, person uh you're black and female would you like to write our black and female thing black and female black and female and she said yes and then something amazing happens Turns out she's really, really racist. Not like says something rude now and then. Sometimes like, oh, that was a little tone deaf. Like she actually hates an entire race of people. I'll let you guess which one. So uh, anyway, it starts off and we've got this, uh, it's time for Nubia, a real one. So this woman uh, starts talking about, you know, when she was growing up, she didn't have any female black superheroes. So I'm like, damn, she's got to be like 60, 70? I looked it up, 39. Yeah. That means in the early 90s, Saturday morning, -na 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 -na. I guess she lived in the city where they edited Storm out of all the episodes of X-Men, the animated series. Um, the uh, These people want to live in different times. They want to pretend that they lived the lives of like recently freed slaves. And yet, they also live lives of incredible privilege. They are handed books without any experience. This is L.L. McKinney's, like, first assignment. She got stuff later. But this is, like, her entry into comics was like, Hey, would you like a character you haven't heard of? Um, yeah, sure, why not? I mean, we're the same race and gender. I mean, it basically writes itself. So we start off, and I will say the best part of this, is there's a thing called... Oh, Hashtag own voices. And the concept between hashtag own voices is that, hey, a black person will probably write black people more authentically than a non-black person, which is fairly unassailable, to which they immediately go, therefore, we should only be able to write black people. And you're like, bro, really? Seriously? Y you were just fine. You started off fairly unassailable, and then you just went crazy. So uh, let's start off. Now, I had a couple bets with a friend that I, lo I actually lost all the bets. I said um, her crew is going to be like one of every single race and then a really, really femi gay guy. Uh, and it turns out that this guy is uh, actually straight. Yeah, so lost that bet. So they're hanging out in front of the uh, the quick stop there, 7-Eleven, whatever it is, AM, PM. And then uh, she likes this guy. And then uh, they kind of leave so she can go, you know, try to have like a meet cute. The guy looks like this because there's this weird propagandist obsessive need to feminize effectively all black male characters in comics. It's been going on for years. It was not invented here, although this is probably... The most feminine. The weird thing is that, okay, so there's a vague hint that this character might be trans. I don't think so. Um, is that uh, these characters are supposed to be straight and like girls. Um, so that's fairly rare in this genre. Uh, and comicsology just stay being comicsology, just freezing right there. I'm not editing this out. I've got to do things. So she goes in, and there's a robbery. And she stops it because she's a superhero. Uh, and then, in some of the best writing, like, ever, the white Karen cashier accuses her of stealing. 
Um, yikes, be better. So, comedians sometimes write backward from the punchline. L.L. McKinney writes backwards from the grievance. Uh, so let's just look at the lay of the land in this poorly drawn convenience store. It's fairly simple. You got an ATM, you got three rows, you got a cashier, back wall, front walls right here. So Nubia disappears for a couple of uh, panels and then she picks up the ATM. Hold this for me. And she throws it at the guy. He gets smashed up against the back wall. And uh, then the uh, cashier says that she was robbing the place. My money, thief, thief. And she points at the black girl. Why would she do that when there's money falling everywhere? Did she really not hear the hold this? She didn't hear the ATM get ripped out of the floor. She was just, <laughs> and then she's clicking the button, click. So then Nubia runs away and uh, she runs right to another racist white person. In uh, this case, it is, oh, there's actually lots of racist white people. There's the mother of, I guess, her first boyfriend. Uh, that was a racist, the racist cashier. Then we're gonna meet, hey, plot twist, racist cop. So uh, hands up, don't shoot, that's topical. He's got his hand on his gun, although his body language is pretty um, non-threatening. Uh, so then uh, she gets let go when every other person says, no, it wasn't the black girl. It was the robbers with the masks, one of who was like knocked out. You thought she was an accomplice? She threw the ATM at them. Um, uh, but it's, it, the writing is very poor. And that's for many reasons. I mean, the woman who wrote this has very, very little experience. Um, I also think that the editors were terrified of her. They were terrified of being canceled if they edited her for her poor writing or they fired her for her obvious and rampant racism. So they were just kind of stuck. I, st I talked to some uh, industry insiders <clears throat> and they said the question was just, how does this get released? You know, DC is not some real small like mom and pop where they're like, oh boy, we had to take out a Like they can, I mean, Marvel could just bury New Warriors. They showed some pages. It was a laughing stock. They didn't release it. You can just not release a book, you know, for various reasons. For instance, you found out that your writer is an actual racist. And every single person in this book, except for one, like her first boyfriend, all of the white people with speaking roles are viciously, violently, proudly racist. So I gotta skip around. So he gets uh, let out, and then of course he's like super blase and um, uh, just racist as hell with her constantly. So then, okay, I gotta go to the two pages. It's, it's gonna take me a, ah, what am I geeking out about? Buttons, how do they work? Okay, so then she goes home and her uh, house is bathed in bisexual lighting and she talks to her mom because of course, <laughs> of course, there's not a father in the house. There are no positive role models in the entire book. We have statistically improbable lesbians. Although, weirdly enough, this seems to be a Hispanic woman. And then later, she kind of talks and references as if she is also black. Um, so she's, uh, they move around every time. By the way, that's not how you draw an ear from the back. <laughs> They move around every time Nubia uses her powers. Even though it's established she lives in the mainstream DC universe where you got the Teen Titans. So every time, every time she uses her powers, racist white people accuse her of committing a crime or attempting assault and then they have to move. Nobody can just explain. They know Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman could just fly there and say, hey, Karen, Check your video footage. This convenience store, like every convenience store since the 80s, has like CCTV. You, you're you just going to point at like the closest person and say, she robbed me even though you weren't looking? Like, There's like five other witnesses who are like, oh no, uh, the ATM was thrown across and it, and it was her. And she has powers, which is cool because it's a DC universe and lots of people have powers and they're heroes. So there, half of this book is just YA blather. I mean, 
so much eating and hugging and crying. And then we go to school. And then we meet the villain. And again, this book is written by a racist. So it's going to be a white villain. The white villain is also not going to have any actual humanity. He's essentially a demon in human flesh. Like it starts off and it looks like he's just like, uh, he doesn't have boundaries. He likes Nubia's friend. She doesn't like him. And then it's like, oh yeah. And then he broke the leg of this girl who rejected him. It's like, that's a pretty big matzo ball just to throw out there. You don't want to make that a character. So they keep referring to Maria, who he beat for rejecting him. And then he gets away because his, quote, family is rich. Again, this place takes place in the DC universe. You need literally one line of dialogue that says he's Lex Luthor's grandson, son, nephew, godson. And every time he gets in trouble, Lex threatens or bribes people and he gets out of it. Then you make it, it's just presented as, I mean, it's like white privilege. You know, like white kids, they rob convenience stores, they break girls' bones. Uh, we're gonna see later he becomes a school shooter. So uh, she, she, we get the or, uh, origin of uh, why she's scared of white people because one time she was demonstrating her powers by lifting a multi-ton vehicle above the head of her white boyfriend and then the mom, when uh, then she drops the car because the mom says, Mark! And then she just drops the car like, oh shit! You were lifting it in the middle of the street. Again, horrible writing written backwards from the grievance. And editors who are terrified of being canceled by the racist that they hired. Now, the mom has a legitimate grievance. Nubia was doing something incredibly dangerous right next to her son. I mean, it's about 10 feet, but still, you would, you know, freak the hell out if something like that happened in real life. But it just becomes... So, the only non-evil white person is her first boyfriend who was just like, Mom, it wasn't even like that. You tried to crush my baby, you freak! Moms tend to be pretty defensive, and though that wasn't the actual explanation, Nubia was ridiculously negligent in her actions. Of course, this is just framed as white people be evil. We're going to see a lot of that. So then, oh, <laughs> hey, speak of the devil, white devil. Uh, there is Wayland uh, shouting some uh, racial epithets, homoph homophobic epithets. Just right there in the hallway of a modern American high school. And then we get the meet cute of Nubia's femboy love interest, Oscar. He's uh, got daisies on his shirt. Moving on. So uh, it's 200 pages. There's not 200 pages of story. <laughs> Uh, but then, um, oh gosh, more hugging and eating and crying. So she gets grounded because of the saving people's lives at a robbery. Uh, but then her friends are going to leave for the summer, so she wants to go to a party. She goes to a party at uh, an unnamed rich person's house. And uh, then, oh my gosh, it's Oscar. And he literally has sparkles around him. Huh, okay, so they're like, okay, go meet our Oscar, uh, they go away, and then they have like the most awkward meet cute, but it's like, meet cutes are supposed to be awkward, but this one is like, was this character like trans in the, in the first draft? She goes to talk to him, he's waving goodbye to his friends, he turns around, and then she accidentally puts her hand on his chest, and that's supposed to be like, Holy shit, the most awkward thing. Like, oh my gosh! Um, so, moving on from there. Uh, let, let's. Can we get to another white person committing a crime? I mean, probably, quote, living their best life to them. So, uh, she's really impressed by this extremely feminine, wimpy guy. You know, it's that's human. That's female human nature. Find the shortest, skinniest, wimpiest, most feminine man. And, uh, you know, try to get his number. So, predictably, guess what? There's a scene of the evil white bullies uh, assaulting people. In this case, it's her friend. Uh, oh, first they're just being rude, so they go in again. They have a little moment. 
And then she tells the story of uh, her almost dropping a car on her first boyfriend. And he's like, yeah, white people are always like that. I mean, come on. So then they go back to the party and uh, Keisha's being uh, sexually assaulted by the evil white guy. Sorry, that was redundant. But this is her like love interest. And he's just like not near her for some for no actual reason. They're at the party together. And then she's just out there. And then they get into a fist fight. So you're like, oh, there's this little crew of friends. It's two girls, one guy. So um, the the white dude uh, tries to fight a girl at a party. And let's cut to the boy in the crew. This is purposeful. I've been doing this channel for four years and I've seen nothing but a constant attempt to feminize black men. I have theories why. I have no idea why a black female writer would want to do that. My theory for the white writers is that they're very terrified of black men. They find them overly aggressive. So they make all their fictional versions, basically black men they aren't scared of. Very, very beta and passive. And they're probably hoping that, uh, oh, I'm, and, and, and that you can see what they think about black women. They're like, um, not trying to subvert your expectations, but my black woman, she's like smart. Yeah. Hashtag woke. Uh, so then he does nothing when a guy tries to get in a fist fight with his female friend. Doesn't move forward. Nothing. Uh, he then uh, uses a racial epithet where she says, say it again. He doesn't say it again. And then she attacks him. Again, she said, say it again. He got scared. He didn't say it again. And then, and then, so you know how this is in the modern day and all these kids are going to have cell phones. They don't record. They, <laughs> they have special phones that can't record context. So nobody records during the preamble to the fight. Nobody has evidence of the attempted, you know, sexual assault. Uh, nobody has evidence of the racial epithet. All they have is the girl punching the white villain. And then she's she's like, oh no, oh no. Uh, again, SJWs do not human very well. This would go viral, but it would be about the boy being a laughingstock. It's like, did you see that video where that black girl like freaking one hit or quitter on that dumbass white dude? Everyone loves that because it's funny. Look at this wimp. He got beat up by a girl. He's pathetic. Like, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, Harry Trask is going to uh, get a sentinel. Bolivar Trask uh, is going to create a sentinel. It's like, oh my gosh, we have to hunt down these strong black girls who are defending themselves from being assaulted. So she runs away. And who would she want to comfort her? After this very upsetting, she was attacked. Uh, and nobody helped her. And I mean, nobody helped her. She had her black crush. And her, her, her friend, two femboys, and they did absolutely no, nothing. So he shows up. He's like, hey, you were super awesome. She's like, yeah, you didn't help. He's like, yeah, he bullied me when I was younger. So I was scared. Uh, and then she just gets over it. There is nothing that a woman likes more than a wimpy man who won't defend her and is scared of the guy that she just beat up. Now, this is where any you know good writer... Any good editor would say, look, he had a bunch of friends. Oscar needs to move forward to help. And the two friends grab him and hold him so he can't help. That's literally two panels. And then he's not a complete piece of shit, pussy, beta ass bitch that she would have actual reason to hate, to despise. But no, she just still likes him because, I don't know, like, what is the explanation? She doesn't value any kind of male traits. She expects nothing of men. If she's getting assaulted, she doesn't expect her, you know, boyfriend to help her out at all. Even just attempt, you know? Remember on Martin when he would, like, not want to fight, but he would, like, pretend to want to fight? So he'd, like, tell his friends, like, hold me back, hold me back. And they're like, we're actually not holding you back. You can go fight him. <laughs> like, nothing, nothing. He's just a complete uh, wimp. So let me get back to the two pages. So then we get a bunch of hugging and crying and um, uh, emotional validation. Don't ever say that 
Don't ever think it. You are perfect, Nubia. Exactly as you are. Oh, I forgot what she got racial. So she got racial. Uh, he got racial, I believe, uh, once so far in the story. And then as they're uh, uh, leaving, she got... Uh, so he starts explaining why he never stood up to Wayland. For real, though, they rich and white. And Waylon usually picks on kids who are very much not. Hmm. Glad I knocked him on his male ass then. Really? Moving on. So anyway, <laughs> uh, then she gets comforted by her, her moms. And of course, one of her mothers has to look like this because it's current year. Why not? Nothing matters. You would think, and eh, nothing, eh, and nah, it's fine. So then it goes viral. This is funny. She has a dream, and in the dream, the wimp is the knight, and she's the princess. It's like, oh, no. So then we get to meet Wonder Woman, who, of course, is purposefully drawn as ugly as possible. She looks like the ultimate warrior. Or maybe like the singing cowboy from Times Square. And then she gives the ridiculous story. It's like, um, hey, we're twins. So they kind of use the origin that they were both created by Hippolyta. And then Ares steals her and like hides her away and then just kind of forgets about her. Uh, and then later on, they're like, oh, and then I found you uh, years later. It's like, okay, so you were really happy to be reunited with your sister, right? Like, so you probably, no. So she just handed her off to like a person she kind of knew. There's no, it's never, please look at the screen. That's Wonder Woman. There's no indication that um, uh, the mom that's an Amazon is like really one of her close friends. She goes, I brought you home to one of my sisters, an Amazon who had found love during a mission in the world of men and decided to stay. It was agreed she and her would raise you, teach you, protect you as their own. So wait, so your sister is Wonder Woman and you're running around the country moving because you stopped bullies? And you just didn't, just didn't say, no, nothing matters. <laughs> Again, the editor is scared of the writer. Look, Please look at the screen. It's ridiculous. She can't even stand in a heroic pose. So come on, we got to get to, we got to get to the, you know, the juicy part, which is uh, uh, white terrorists terrorizing people with their whiteness and their white privilege. So they got to, they got a protest um, for a kid who was shot. I didn't pick up that the kid was supposed to be trans but when Os oh hey look there's the white evil guy again again threatening to get in a fist fight with a girl the funny thing is like what's his name acts like he's gonna fight but then he doesn't he's like you got a problem you got a problem and then he just stops and he just crosses his arms he's like there's three of us it's like two of you are girls this is not even a tough looking guy like you can't fight just this dude so then the other two white guys are like, oh, shit. And they leave. He's like, <laughs> he goes completely insane with rage. He's like, you're going to get yours, bitch. All of you. Every last fucking one. So then they go to the protest and Oscar shows up with a shirt that says, stop killing black trans women. And he looks like a black trans woman. If you're going to make the character trans, you should probably mention it. Um, and he, okay, so... Then uh, they're, it's, it's like a fun day. It's a fun day. It's a protest. Uh, so they're all having, you know, fun. And then uh, some police, cops. And then all of a sudden, the peaceful protest turned into be not so peaceful. And guess who started it? You, you all said white people. So uh, a brick is thrown. Oh, two bricks. There are two bricks thrown. There is one uh, thrown at a squad car. Okay, so it's thrown, uh, you hear a crash, squad car window bashed in, and then Keisha decides to get up. Well, at least he does have some ability. He can be essentially a step stool. Um, I know this looks scary, but we have done nothing wrong. Uh, excuse me, a brick was thrown from the crowd. So at least one person has done something wrong. We have a right to protest peacefully. Again, the brick, thrown from your crowd. We have a right to be heard. We have a right to make them listen. 
I, you, that's actually not a right. <laughs> Everyone stay calm. Look after each other. Stay smart. Stay safe. So then they're like, okay, so yeah, that, okay, there goes another brick. Again, nobody can look and follow the trajectory. Not one person in the crowd saw who threw a second brook, book, brick, you know what I mean, while yelling pigs. Guess who it was? Hits the police. Oh no, there's going to be trouble. Who could it have been? I wonder if it was Richie Cunningham, <laughs> Ralph Melf, and Patsy. So in the middle of a Black Lives Matter-esque peaceful protest, three preppy white guys threw two bricks and oh my gosh. Okay, first of all, look. What do you see in his left hand? It's kind of hard to tell what it is. It's cropped a little bit. It is, and then look at, this is the greatest two panel progression in the history of freaking comics. He stares at her like a complete psycho. Then he holds up finger guns and he goes, pow. And then he throws the Lent Molotov cocktail that he had in his left hand. That nobody saw. Nobody in the entire crowd of Gen Z people with smartphones. Nobody saw it. And then it explodes, and then she's like, oh, shit. Uh, so then uh, the police start doing their job, to which uh, she's like, okay, I need everyone to freak out as much as possible. Then they sneak away. And I laughed so hard, like, this looks so stupid. Um, so then they're sneaking. They come around the corner, some police see them, and they say, freeze. And then, in some incredibly good writing, do you see these lights from behind? That's supposed to be the sun. And it's reflecting off of her bracelet. And the cops think the bracelet is a weapon. They're 15, 20 feet away. You can see half of her forearm. Very clearly a bracelet. Put it down! And then, uh, yeah, this is amazing writing. And they shoot her. Because they thought... It was a weapon. Even though when she had her hand up, you could see all of her, her whole hand, all of her fingers, quite clearly. I guess technically you couldn't see part of her thumb, but it's very clearly not holding a weapon of any kind. Uh, so then they shoot and, uh, oh, I forgot to say that um, uh, Wonder Woman did nothing when she came to visit. She's like, oh yeah, I'm Wonder Woman, I'm your sister, here's some bracelets. Bye! Didn't help. Didn't look for this, you know, bully on a reign of terror. And then, even though Oscar was to the left of her, somehow the bullet went in the left side of him. Maybe she can curve bullets like in that movie Wanted. Uh, so then uh, she freaks out and uh, grabs one of the cops, disarms him, throws him 20 feet into another cop, and then takes uh, old Oscar here to... Uh, Bisexual Lighting General Hospital. Then it gets in this weird thing where like she takes him there, but she can't visit him. So we waste like 20 pages on that shit. Uh, so, oh, we're finally in the last one. So then the uh, evil white guys, sorry, that was redundant. They get on the school message board and they start trying to uh, gaslight everyone. They're like, we know who did it at the protest. It's like, it's like 500 people there. In fact, they even like give the number how many people there. There's 500 people there. Again, the editor is scared of the writer. The writer is clearly racist from the script. What is she going to do? Tell her to redo something? The only editing I think was done is that the convenience store robbery, it's not really referred later to say that Wayland and his friends did it. I'm sure in the first draft it was done that way, and even the editor was like, oh, this is so stupid. And then she was probably like, hey, queen, you know, they ain't ready for this much truth, girl. And the writer was like, all right, we'll just say that was two other. They made a point of saying that the, uh, the robbers were white, but then they never did anything with that uh, storyline. They didn't say like, hey, Wonder Woman, you want, maybe want to look for those two robbers out there? So then um, uh, more food, more hugging, more crying. That goes on for a while. Come on, let's get to the good stuff. Crazy-ass white people, white people. They're so crazy. 
So then she uh, she is given the offer to not go to school, you know, because her friend got a... What was the deal? Her friend got shot. She's upset. So uh, they're like, you stay home from school. And she's like, no, I want to go to school. Fantastic writing. Why does this character want to go to school the day after her friend was shot uh, by the police? Because uh, the writer uh, decided that um, Waylon also needs to be a school shooter. So she needs to be at school. That is just wow, super good writing. So she's sleeping in class. Active shooter drill. Uh, the uh, teacher barricades the room, you know, as you're supposed to do. And then she starts thinking, she's like, I got to do something. And then she goes, oh, my friend. This is, oh, this is just so good. They go, holy shit, it's Wayland. The shooter is Wayland Carson. What? Michelle just saw him by the gym. He's got a gun. She posted a pic. Let me see. And then she's like, I have to go save uh, my friend because he's in the library and my friend has study hall in the library. She's such good friends with her friend that she's memorized her friend's schedule. And then Nubia, like a possessed demon, tears down the barricade that her teacher put up to uh, protect an entire classroom so she can maybe go protect uh, her friend. And then she goes over to the library. Please, <laughs> such bad. <laughs> so everyone's running out of the library. And then she runs in. <laughs> oh my gosh. This skinny dork has the gun pointing the wrong way. She's on the ground crying. You don't get to say no to me, not you. Wait, is this a school shooting sexual assault? Did you do a school shooting just to corner? Like, wh what is she saying no to? So then uh, Nubia throws a book, knocks the gun out of his hand. All right, cool. Rescue. Done. Good. You got super strength. You got super speed. And then her friend tells Nubia to run. What the fuck? And then Nubia runs. Well, she runs towards her. She went the opposite way. And then she's able to pick up her friend, but ha doesn't have time to kick the gun, pick up the gun, or just stomp on it so it doesn't work anymore. So uh, we get one shot. We're going to get a bunch of shots. Uh, we see that she's not bulletproof. Uh, there's a very easy way to just run out of the room, but she doesn't take it. They have a long conversation. They, they uh, say they love each other. Then finally, she uh, tells her friend to run. Uh, then she decides, oh my, you know what? I'm going to play on his fragile masculinity. You still feeling fragile? Poor baby. Not smart to insult the man with the gun. Man, you're just some little boy who couldn't handle losing a fight to a girl. So you whip out a gun to feel better about yourself. Shut up! Wait. Keisha, what you... When she said run, she meant out the door, not just like behind the little checkout place. Do strong girls scare you, Wayland? I bet you're terrified. I said shut up! That's why you try to intimidate them. And when that doesn't work, you hurt them. Like Maria, who we've never met. Would have been a lot more powerful if we would have met Maria. Perhaps Maria and Keisha could have been combined into the same character. Would have made everything... No, no. <laughs> the editor is terrified. Absolutely terrified of the writer. Maria didn't know her place. None of you bitches do. You need reminders. Broken, bun broken bones and bullets? Whatever gets the job done. You can't even stop shaking long enough to aim straight. You think I'm scared of you? You're nothing. Nothing! Just ghetto trash that needs to be cleaned up. And everyone's gonna see. So then we get to like this helpful flashback from our mother. Whenever you're in trouble, take a moment to ground yourself. Remember to breathe, says remember. Stay in the now. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? I got video of you attacking those cops at the protest. Really? There, There's video... There's no video to exonerate her at the convenience store, in a modern day, you know, convenience store that would have cameras everywhere. 500 people at the protest. Nobody visually saw and can testify or have video of two rocks and a Molotov being thrown. Not Molotov being, you know, lit. Um, 
But they have videos of attacking the cops. She actually could get in trouble for that. But she did do it. And then, <laughs> please look at the screen. That's how they draw Wonder Woman. Because they can't draw her attractive. Because if they draw her attractive, that might make a man happy. So, no. So then Wonder Woman gives the worst advice ever. I know it's tough. But whatever decision you make is the right one. What in the name of emotional validation you... What? Any decision is good? So while she's hiding behind the stacks, she can just get on her phone. She's like, what are you doing over there? What are you doing? What are you planning? She's like, I just joined ISIS. <laughs> oh, you know, there's a, there's a website. I just joined ISIS. He's like, why? Well, Wonder Woman told me literally anything I do is correct. So I... Did, did that fix things? No! Now I'm going to be a hero who just shot someone who's an ISIS. She'd be like, well, I didn't get a response yet. You know, maybe they'll reject me. Uh, <laughs> so then she flashes back to, of course, only female role models. Because there are no positive role models. We have not met uh, a father. We have not met a male teacher. Uh, all we've met is uh, two black femboys and uh, a bunch of incel alt-right terrorist school, sh school shooter convenience store robbing. I'm assigning that to Whalen. It, it doesn't make sense. That was I'm sure that was in the first draft. Besides, bodies don't talk. But guess what does talk? You. And when you recorded on her cellular telephone, she's got proof. That you're a bad person. Yeah, nobody saw you in a crowd of 500 people. Sure, there's no, you know, cameras in a modern school that would have... Hey, didn't like 20 people run out of there and they can testify that you were in there a gun, shooting it off, and terrorizing Keisha? But she got a recording on her cellular telephone. Bang! And then she does what she should have done, like, 15 pages ago. Just, you know, knock a bookcase onto him. But, uh, he's nimble. Jumps out of the way. And uh, then she goes, someone's going viral. Wait, no, this isn't, this isn't right. And then uh, he starts having his incel breakdown. She fires the gun. He, there's a lot of bullets in this gun. She blocks it. And then usually in writing, the bullet needs to go somewhere. It needs to bounce back into him and then he dies. And she inadvertently took a life and she has to deal with that. It bounces and it hits uh, Oscar. He's walking in to help. He gets shot a second time. Or Keisha. Or maybe there was just one camera. One camera. And he was recording everything. And it will, it will put him in jail and it will exonerate her. But the bullet hit the camera and it was, you know, the footage was stored locally. And so now there's no proof because it hit the camera. Isn't that ironic, don't you think? Uh, but no, the bullet just goes wherever... And then she uh, she gives him a black eye. I warned you you'd get a matching set. Uh, he tried to, to, to rape and murder your friend. Started a riot. Robbed a convenience store. And that was like your priority? Okay, so then she's in the hospital. And then they do this weird meet cute where Oscar is there. And so they're in the same hospital. The hospital she put him in. <laughs> And, uh, okay, so first to friends, and, like, everything's, like, silly Billy. I don't know why, but when this guy, there's, like, a joke about, like, don't touch those cookies. Jason, don't touch my cookies. And then they leave, and he tries to sneak one. And she says, I'll make sure he behaves. And he's, like, all embarrassed. It's, like, you're not embarrassed about being a total punk bitch who didn't even help your girlfriend when she was being sexually assaulted. You didn't help anyone. And, but... Tee hee cookies, am I right? And then the way he jumps <laughs> onto the bed, it really bothered me for some reason. So then we get to see Oscar, who is alive and uh, just kind of fine with everything. He has a really strange answer. They're like, Oscar, you're okay. I've had worse. When? <laughs> even, even the grandma says when, and we don't follow that up. And then uh, they get embarrassed because... Oh my gosh, they have a crush on each other. They're like juniors in high school. It makes no sense. Then the grandma is like, 
he likes you. Please look at this. This is like one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. All of a sudden, it looks like somebody like ripped all of the skin off of his face. And we're looking at like the muscle and blood vessels. Like you're a junior in high school and you're embarrassed because your grandma said he has a crush on you. <laughs> this is terrible, terrible writing. So like the ending just drags on forever and then they kiss and it just ends. Now she gets to be uh, in a relationship with the uh, guy who wouldn't defend her that she inadvertently got shot. You go, girl. Uh, so this was uh, awful. <laughs> and uh, it's... Uh, well, I gave it one star. Uh, it's, uh, I would say, made to be laughed at, but not intentionally. So this book was very, very racist. In fact, like I said, I talked to insiders and they were just kind of shocked it got released. You can absolutely just bury this stuff. You could also make it not racist with just a few lines of dialogue. You know, his uh, his dad is uh, Lex Luthor, or maybe, uh, you know, um, oh, God. What's the albino black gangster uh, who's in uh, Black Lightning? Yes, I know it's different. They've, they've merged the timelines. Um, uh, you're, you'd be like, oh, that's his dad. So... At one point, he's protected because his dad is a rich gangster. But on the other hand, his dad is black, and that's why he doesn't like black people. I give some depth to it. Not just his family has money. Well, you can tell if they have money. I mean, he goes to public school. Um, or just any kind of depth. <laughs> Maybe you have more than one character that's white and isn't evil. And that was a flashback. In non-flashbacks, there were zero, zero non-evil white people with speaking roles have a positive male character father figure teacher or maybe have one of the two femboys not be a complete bitch ass just because you're a little femmy doesn't mean you have to be a punk you know there's all kinds of i remember uh, i was talking to a friend and he was he was basically saying he uh he's saying you know uh he grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood and he was talking about a cousin or something who uh, um, was transitioned. And I was like, oh, was it rough for them? It's like, well, the parents just said, you got to be able to fight. They're like, we don't care if you transition, but you can't be a punk. If someone, you know, starts messing with you, you got to fight. And so the person was like, yeah, well, I'll fight him. Uh, so they're fine with it. You know what I mean? Just because you're skinny or short or, you know, or a little femmy doesn't mean you have to be a complete chicken shit, coward, worthless piece of shit like those two characters were, like have what all you have to do is like he steps forward and then, you know, a, a Wayland like grabs like a steel pipe and just like hits Oscar in the head. You're like, holy shit. Um, and then two of his buddies grab, uh, what was his name? Jason. And now they don't have any, you know, uh, uh, men to defend him or help out. Like a couple of lines could have fixed this. But again, the editor was terrified. They hired someone. I mean, they had the best of intentions. They're like, hey, you, skin and gender, you're hired. And she's like, wow. These dumb motherfuckers don't know how racist I am. Then you turn in the script. It's 200 pages. It's racist as fuck. So now what does the editor do? Fire the racist? <laughs> you're going to get destroyed on social media. Edit her more than a tiny little bit? Oh, boy. Then you get all the blind items. You know, some uh, people need to stay in their lane because I'm telling my authentic truth. Anyway, holy shit. I don't even have to edit this video. 43 minutes. I would I would have been four hours editing the original uh, uh, version. Uh, but anyway, Rock and Roll Ninja graphic novel. 499 graphic novel. So I ended this with um, kind of a, a, the, the original version, kind of with a, a downer but with an upside. Things are weird right now. In fact, when I talk to friends, I go, as much as people say things are kind of weird right now and, you know, uh, it's kind of an oppressive atmosphere of cancel culture, in 10 to 20 years, we're going to realize it was actually much worse than we thought it was. So one of the ways you get through this, you know, I, I did some bummer videos where I was just basically like, things are going to be rough. I didn't have any answers. The answer is stuff like this. Laugh at these people. They're ridiculous. They're clowns. These, these people want to pat themselves on the back for being so woke. 
And they're as racist as the day is long. They're either racist in one way, in the way that L.L. L. McKinney is is uh, racist towards one race. I won't tell you which one, but I think you can guess. And then the editor is racist in another way. Absolutely terrified of a black female writer. Um, the way I would describe it is that the writer looks at white people like they're demons, and the editor looks at black people like they're animals. An animal is not necessarily evil, but it's not... So you can't reason with an animal, you know? You can't have a conversation. Uh, and then, you know, some animals do attack suddenly. So that the editor was obviously absolutely terrified of the writer. The writer was like, oh my God, this dumb bitch. <laughs> okay, first of all, all the white people are evil. Second of all, all the black guys are femboys. And they're bitches. They're total cowards. Say something. Say something, Becky. Say something, Karen. I dare you. I double dare you. Anyway, go check out 499, Rock and Roll Ninja. I'm going to upload this without editing. Wow. And I will have more new comic reviews up all this week. Thanks. Bye.